I will call the public hearing to order and read this um, little piece here. This public hearing is being held pursuant to Section 465 of the Local Government Act. All members of the public will be given a reasonable time to be heard or to present written submissions respecting matters contained in the bylaw that is the subject of this hearing. All information, correspondence, petitions or reports that have been received by noon today concerning the subject bylaw have been circulated to Council and are available to the public as part of the meeting package. Staff will provide their report followed by an opportunity for an applicant to speak. Uh, sorry, for the applicant to speak. Members of the public who have pre-registered to speak have been added to the speakers list in the order that requests were received. Anyone who is not pre-registered may call into the conference line during the live meeting by dialing 778-907-2071 and entering meeting ID 506-489-9371. And passcode 485186. There will be an opportunity for public comment according to the speakers list, followed by comment from those who have just joined the meeting. Speakers will be asked to state their name and civic address. Please note that all representations, whether written, in person, or electronic, are available for the public to view as part of the public record. Remarks will be limited to five minutes per speaker and should include all of the relevant information in their presentation. Further opportunity will be afforded all members of the public to speak a second or third time with new information only once all persons have had the opportunity to speak. Council may ask questions of staff and public, but once the public hearing is over, no new information can be received. Council debate on the bylaw will take place during the regular council meeting following the conclusion of the public hearing. At that time, any questions of staff will be for clarification purposes only. The corporate officer will now provide information on the notice of this public hearing. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Notice of this public hearing was provided by posting a notice at Municipal Hall advertising in the Summerland Review on December 3rd and 10th, and by mailing 13 statutory notices to owners and occupiers in the surrounding area. Thank you. Um, who is presenting? Is it Brad or Alex tonight? I will be presenting. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead. All right, let me just queue up the shared screen here. All right. <clears throat> So an application has been received to rezone the property at 1505 Britain Road from residential estate lot zone RSD3 to residential large lot zone RSD2 to allow for the construction of a single family dwelling and carriage home on the property. The site is currently a vacant lot in Summerland's Trout Creek neighborhood. In the RSD2 zone, single detached dwelling is a permitted use. The proposal to rezone the property to RSD2 to facilitate home construction is supported by the official community plan and conforms to the density envisioned by the OCP. The rationale behind this application is to ensure that the required front setback is consistent with other homes in the neighborhood. Neighboring properties are zoned as RSD2 and require a six meter front yard setback, whereas 1505 Britain Road is currently zoned as RSD3, requiring a seven meter front yard setback. Rezoning this property would allow the neighborhood to maintain its form and character considering the existing setbacks. Another rationale for this change is to increase the allowable coverage of, on the property. The applicant plans to construct a single detached home as well as a carriage house the existing coverage allowed under RSD3 is 30%.
the proposed rezoning is to uh, the proposed rezoning to RSD2 would increase the allowable coverage to 40%, making it easier to site both a home and a carriage home. The impact of rezoning 1505 Britain Road on neighboring properties is anticipated to be minimal as the area is dominated by single detached homes. The surrounding neighborhood is, is already zoned as RSD2. Further, the proposed change will allow the new home to be constructed with a similar street front character to the homes already existing in the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Me. Oh, <laughs> I don't have anyone on the speakers list. Um, do you know if the proponent was wishing to speak tonight? I don't believe so. Okay. Okay, so uh, is there anybody else that uh, wishes to speak? I'll ask uh, three times. Anybody else that wishes to speak on this, the public hearing tonight? And for a third and final time, is there anybody else that would wish to speak uh, to the public hearing before us tonight? Okay, so let's... Um, open it up for, no, sorry, um, we're, we're done then, aren't we? <laughs> um, so I will uh, adjourn the public meeting then, or sorry, the public hearing, and uh, we will get on to our regular council meeting. So if you just give me a minute to bring that up. So I will call to order the uh, regular council meeting of December the 14th. This meeting is being recorded live and is streaming on the District of Summerland YouTube channel, youtube.com District of Summerland. All representations to council, written or verbal, will form part of the public record and be available for the public, sorry, to the public for viewing electronically or as a written record. Members of the public may access the meeting or participate in the following ways. One, watch the meeting live or recorded. Individuals who wish to watch the meeting may view it on the District of Summerland YouTube channel, youtube.com, District of Summerland, live or recorded. District, sorry, number two, register in advance to speak during the meeting. Members of the public who wish to provide comment during the public Comment opportunities found under items 8 and 15 are asked to register in advance by contacting the corporate officer at corporateofficer at summerland.ca with the following information. Your name, civic address, and how you wish to participate, whether it be by telephone or Zoom. Further details will be provided to you upon registration. Three, request to speak during the meeting. Those who have not registered in advance but wish to speak during the public comment opportunities may connect to the meeting by calling the meeting conference line at 778-907-2071 and enter meeting ID 506-489-9374 and passcode 485-186. After I have provided everyone who has pre-registered with an opportunity to comment, the floor will be open to those on the conference line. Uh, corporate officer, we moved or deferred an item to uh, this evening's meeting. Where would you like that to go? Thank you, Madam Mayor. So we'd like to add the Visitor Center Electric Vehicle Charging Station report following the development reports. Um, so as item 9.6. Thank you. And are there any other changes to the agenda? None, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. So could I ask a councillor to bring forward the amended uh, agenda for adoption, please? Councillor Trainer, seconder, Councillor Holmes, all in favor? Great, thank you. And uh, 
uh, adoption of minutes um, from our regular council meeting of November the 23rd. Any, any changes, errors, or omissions in there? Okay, could I have someone bring that forward, please? Thank you, Councillor Holmes and Councillor Carlson. All in favor? Great. Okay, moving on to bylaws. So we're talking about the zoning bylaw amendment that we just heard in the public hearing to rezone um, from RSD3 to RSD2 at 1505 Britain Road. Okay, uh, council, questions on this? Okay, may I have someone bring this forward, please? Councillor Trainer. I'll bring it forward for third time and to be adopted. Thank you. Third. <clears throat> and seconded by Councillor Holmes, thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Great, that carries. Okay, and then on to the mayor's report. If you give me a sec, I'll just pull it up. Okay, on November the 30th, Council had a Committee of the Whole meeting to hear the results of the community engagement on the proposed Summerland Recreation and Health Centre. The meeting agenda also included a report and discussion on a review of recreation fees and charges. Staff will be reporting back to Council on proposed new fees at a regular meeting uh, sometime in the new year. On December the 2nd, I attended the Southern Interior Local Government Association meeting. Vanderhoof Councillor Brian Frankel, who is the new president of the Union of BC Municipalities, spoke at the meeting about the key areas UBCM is working on in 2020-21 on behalf of all local governments in BC. These are infrastructure stimulus money, economic diversification, rural transit, rural connectivity, GHG emissions reduction, a three-digit mental health hotline, and anti-racism. The 2021 convention, so of SILGA, originally scheduled to be held in Vernon, will be online and preparations are well underway. On December 7th, Council and I attended the virtual utility budget and and uh, rates open house. And earlier today, we um, passed the third reading of that. And on Friday, we'll look at adopting those new rates. This is the last council meeting of what has been an unprecedented and stressful year for everyone, no matter where one lives. I like, I, like many Summerland residents, have changed how I traditionally celebrate Christmas. However, while Dr. Henry and her team project, her team project <laughs> rising COVID counts over the next days and weeks, there is still much to be thankful for. Not the least of which is that we, as a community, are doing our level best to protect our friends, families, and neighbors. On behalf of Council, thank you to each and every essential worker who has risked their personal safety to serve the rest of us and continues to do so. And thank you to each of you in Summerland for your continued diligence and patience. We wish you a safe and healthy holiday season and beyond through 2021. Thank you. Okay, our acting CAO. Thank you, Mayor Boot. Um, again, on the theme of the last regular meeting of council before the holidays, I would just like to provide a few reminders of district operations and office closures to our residents over the next few weeks. Our parks and recreation team will continue to welcome people to our aquatic center and arena for various fitness opportunities, including public swimming and public skating all throughout the holidays. 
Um, they are operating, of course, under strict COVID regulations and guidelines to ensure the safety of residents and staff and to ensure they can remain open to the public. So just a reminder to adhere to all the protocols that are in place. There is a holiday health club and swim schedule as well as the holiday skate schedule posted to the district website at summerland.ca slash parks and recreation. So Municipal Hall and our Works Administration offices will be closed for the week between Christmas and New Year's, closing at 2 p.m. on December 24th and reopening on January the 4th. Our Works crews will be monitoring their phone line for any emergency calls. As those who may have visited Municipal Hall lately, um, you might have noticed we're moving things around a little bit. So when we reopen on January the 4th, residents will notice the development services team has been relocated to the public lobby space, switching locations with corporate services. Over the next few weeks and through the Christmas break, the remainder of the old carpet will be replaced as staff ensure the workspaces are set up and ready to go on January the 4th. We all look forward to welcoming Graham Stott to the district on January 4th in his new role as Chief Administration Officer for the District of Summerland. But in the meantime, on behalf of staff at the district, we wish everyone a very happy, healthy and safe holiday season. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is the first of two opportunities for the public to comment. Uh, I do not have any notation that there is anybody wishing to comment. Okay, thank you. Um, and so on to our first development report, 9.1 Z20-012, site-specific text amendment for 19223 Lakeshore Drive North. And this is one that uh, Ariane is taking for us. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So the district received an application for a site-specific text amendment to the zoning bylaw for a property located at 19223 Lakeshore Drive North to allow three single detached housing or three single detached dwellings on their property. So the property's OCP future land use designation is low density residential and the property is also zoned A1. And as you can see, these land uses are consistent with adjacent properties. Ariane? Yes? Uh, could I have you check your screen? What, what we're seeing right now is just your, your drive that shows your files. <laughs> we don't have an open PowerPoint in front of us yet. Okay, let me change that. Here we go. Yeah, I think you that like looks great. The beginning or here I can just pull up <laughs> this one. Okay, so as you can see, the future land use designation and zoning are consistent within the area as far as low density is concerned. It's mostly just single detached houses that are down there. And the property also falls within a water course development permit and the where the, where the existing houses falls entirely within this area, as well as the uh, pieces of the cottage as well, which we'll be speaking to in a moment. So on the property, there are currently three dwellings. So we have the uh, existing principal dwelling here, a cottage or a guest house located in this corner, and then a garage with a suite located above it. Um, so these buildings, um, many of them were constructed uh, quite a long time ago, but without the benefit of building permits or development variance permits. And as such, they are non-conforming uses. So any additions or alterations to these uses wouldn't be permitted as it would be a contravention of the regulations within the zoning bylaw. So the motivation at this time is to bring these buildings into compliance um, because the owners would like to do renovations to the existing non-conforming buildings. So 
here is sort of a proposed plan. It's not um, something that the owners are, uh, you know, this is just to show what the footprint of the buildings could be like, um, because the size of this lot could accommodate a very large single detached house, a carriage house and accessory buildings and structures. So to compensate for the two additional, two additional single detached houses, the applicant is proposing provisions to reduce the maximum lot coverage from 40% to 30%. Uh, to reduce the maximum floor area ratio from 0 0.54 to 0 0.35. Um, and in doing so, this limits the size and massing of the development on the property. So for example, 40% coverage under the existing RSD1 zone is 1,362.8 meters squared or about uh, just over 14,000 square feet. And if coverage is reduced to 30%, the maximum would be 1,022.1 meters squared, um, or about 11,000 square feet. And the image on the screen right now shows lot coverage at 27%. So this just gives an idea of what the applicant is proposing at this time. Um, another way that uh, the proposed bylaw amendments would reduce um, future development on this property is also by uh, prohibiting carriage houses and secondary suites once there are three principal dwelling units. So this proposal also has support from residents within the Crescent Beach neighborhood, including those that would be most impacted by this development. And yeah, so these are just some of the proposed uh, bylaws that I was speaking to that would reduce the massing of the buildings. And uh, after circulating this application through two internal departments, uh, district staff noted that pit meters will be required on the additional dwellings. Um, they'll also have to apply for building permits for the proposed works if and when uh, these amendments are approved. And they'll also have to start being charged a monthly base water fee and environmental levy, environmental levy and a monthly sewer fee and a monthly residential garbage fee, which they are not currently being charged because these buildings were built without permits. So this application was considered by the Advisory Planning Commission, and they had an interesting discussion based on, you know, the property having a history of building without permits, um, and then also the role of the commission uh, not being to enforce regulations or penalize owners, but to bring non-conforming uses into compliance with the district zoning bylaw. So it was a split decision at uh, the APC and no resolution was passed. So given that these structures already exist and that the size and site coverage of potential future development will be reduced as a result of the proposed amendments, staff recommend that this application be given first and second reading and that a public hearing be held on January 11th, 2021. Thank you. Thanks, Arianne. Uh, questions, Council? Councillor Patton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, a question to staff or to our Director of uh, Development Services. Uh, we know that the maximum size currently of a carriage house in the secondary suite is no more than 968 square feet. Do you know what the square footage of the guest house is and what the square footage of the carriage house is uh, presently that's on, the, on site? I'll pass that question to Ariane. I'm not too sure of the details of the current site coverage for the application. Yeah, so we don't have the size of the existing dwellings as they are. No. And because they were built without permits, um, we don't have a record in the file. If I may, Madam Mayor, uh, would, we, would it not be prudent for us to ensure that the size of those two structures are falling within current uh, bylaw of the 968 square feet before we move forward where they could be 1500 square feet. We'd be opening up a door that we can't close with other properties um, within, uh, within the district. And just a, just a, a note, but um, uh, they were built without permit. They could be oversized. Now they're asking for an exception for three, three units. Um, on a property and um, I'm just not, I'm a little concerned in regards to size that it hasn't been brought forward. Thank you. Yep. Uh, 
Uh, Brad, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, through uh, Madam Mayor, uh, I wonder, Ariane, if you can share your your slide again uh, with regards to that that site plan that was provided by the applicant uh, that shows the potential development footprint, because there is an outline provided on that uh, site plan of the of the existing structures on. Uh, the site. So, although it doesn't show dimensions, um, uh, it, it, they are smaller than the uh, than what is proposed for expansion. So, the hatched area here are potential expansion areas of the homes, um, uh, um, and what's in white in the white outline are existing structures located on the site. Um, but uh, um, Councillor Patton's uh, point that th th these, these dwellings are most likely already larger than 960 square feet, um, although we don't know the exact size. Um, and, but for that reason, they are seeking a, a rezoning for three uh, dwellings and not specifically to allow for a carriage house and be subject to those regulations. Councillor Carlson. Thank you. I was just making note that there's a proposed lot A and lot B. Is this in anticipation of a subdivision or does that already exist? Um, there's no house on proposed lot A. So I'm just wondering um, if that, this is the first step in a longer process. Yeah, so uh, to bring that one up again. So it is a separate lot that already has been subdivided. So um, all of the lot coverage calculations are for lot one. And nothing is built on the other lot? No. As, okay, thank you. Any other questions, Council? Councillor Trainer. Did the applicant give any reasons um, for not having a building permit when these structures were done 25 years ago? Yeah, so some of the structures have been built um, over quite a bit of time. So 25 years is the last record in the file that we have. Um, others were built in the thirties, um, but we have no indication as to why they didn't um, get building permits at the time. Because the one that was built, like the garage looks fairly new, but maybe that is 25 years old, I guess it is. That's the most recent one, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Do we have anything in our development bylaws that uh, speak to the number of, because all three of these are residences, uh, that speak to the number of residents you get you can have on a single lot? Or is it just simply the lot coverage? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take a crack at answering that one. Um, yes, uh, the zoning uh, for an RSD1 lot uh, indicates that, uh, that the, the intended use is for uh, one principal dwelling um, within a single family area. Um, so that's written in the purpose of the zone, first of all. Um, uh, and, and so that, that's what, you know, specifies the type of land use that will be proposed throughout the area and for that reason like duplex isn't allowed in rsd1 zone now what's before council tonight is a site specific provision though to to bend that rule for this uh specific property um to allow these three existing dwellings uh to to be equally 
located on the site and have equal, uh, I guess, standing as principal residences uh, within the zone. So it would be we what we were asking council to to do is uh, waive the requirement to have only one principal dwelling uh, within a RSD one zoning. Thank you, Councillor Carlson. Yeah, just wondering if when something like this comes to the attention of city, um, is it, you know, if, if the landowner has other properties, do we look at to ensure that those properties are now conforming or is it we wait until they apply for applications for other renovations or things? Just as a, um, I guess that's just a general question because now we're we see more and more of this, you know, we've, we've seen a few in the last year where we look back at someone who maybe didn't follow the rules a few years ago, and now we're asking them to um, follow some new rules so that they can continue building. Um, but we also know that someone may have multiple properties and perhaps we should be paying attention to if they didn't, if they might be in non-conformance in other places, just to, maybe that's an aside, but worth noting. Yeah, just a comment to follow up on that um, uh, through Madam Mayor. Uh, I think uh, the, 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 the time to bring things into conformance is usually through building permit stage. Um, that is kind of our enforcement tool uh, to, to bring th uh, properties into compliance uh, with our zoning bylaw. Um, we are uh, actively looking for unauthorized work and, and construction. Uh, we actually just uh, found a, a new property today that perhaps was was initiating a, a new house on a property uh, that uh, we're uh, we need to bring them in for a building permit. So um, that that is our enforcement tool, and we do have enforcement staff actively inspecting properties throughout the district to ensure that they are building uh, and uh, with conform conformance with our regulations. Um, but if, if something hasn't been built on for a number of years and it's been existing for a number of years, it's, it's tough for us to enforce on that. Um, Councillor Holmes. So if we didn't approve this, what, what options would they have? Would they have to tear down one of those uh, dwelling units? Or convert it into something that's not a, a resident. Um, they they are allowed to have accessory buildings, so we would have to look at um, uh, the the uh, site coverage in terms of how it meets the accessory uh, building regulations. And they could convert those um, existing structures to an accessory building that would be. Uh, not suitable for a dwelling purpose. Um, so I think that would be the one all, one approach to bring into conformance with our bylaw. And then just decide which one is the principal residence that they want to keep. Um, I have a question that's a, li a little bit related to that. Um, in the presentation by Arian, um, did I hear correctly that they want to make three principal dwellings on this one lot? They want to convert them all to principal dwellings? Okay, and that's why, um, although, you know, probably should have been done in the past. That's why curbside collection fees of the environmental levy and the utilities are being applied to each of the three proposed principal dwellings. Um, so how does that work in terms of property taxes? I'll take a crack at answering that one again. Um, I don't think it'll factor too much in the assessed value of the property. An assessor would uh, look at the existing buildings on site um, and determine the you know the value of those buildings on site, and perhaps might 
make a difference to the assessor that they're in conformance. Um, uh, it may also uh, um, increase the value of the property, perhaps if uh, they, the, the zoning is in place compared to only one dwelling. Um, um, but uh, um, they, th this, th it probably has been included in the, um, the valuation historically, if uh, those buildings have been there and being used for residential purposes historically. Well, I guess, I guess my question is, um, when, you're, when you're claiming your homeowner's grant on a property that you own, you can only claim it, you can only claim the homeowner's grant on a, on a single principal dwelling. But if all three of these are on the same property, does that mean that all three of them will be eligible for claiming the homeowner's grant because they're all considered principal residences? Because that doesn't seem to sit quite right. Uh, I, I, that would be a question to our, our finance director and unfortunately he's not on the call right now. So right. I, I think it could go with one property. I'm not too sure. Okay. Um, if I could just ask one other question, seeing as, unless there's a counselor that has another question just now. Councillor Patton, we'll go to you and then I can, I can speak again. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, can our director, um, did we actually do a site visit and go into this carriage house on this property? The reason I ask is when you look at photo number three, it's very odd that you have two doors um, and a third door, which you could say is to the garage, but if you went farther west, there's another man door there. It almost looks like there, you talked about a duplex. This, this almost has the tendency to fall into the realm of a duplex. So I'm just wondering if, if staff actually went on site and walked through this unit or if they're taking the word of the applicant. That, that's, I'm just wondering, because it, it just, it, it doesn't look right. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, our staff member, Ariane, uh, as well as CEO Anthony Haddad uh, visited the site before uh, I was working with the district. Um, uh, Ariane, do you uh, want to comment on that? Yes, Anthony and I went in late September, early October to the site, and we just walked around the property itself, um, mostly because of COVID as well and wanting to stay outside. We didn't want to go into, into the buildings. So it possibly is two units within that carriage in which they called a carriage house then. It, just throwing in a little bit of doubt there. So yeah, it's <laughs> possible. It's, it's possible. Out. Okay, no, and, and that's fine. I don't. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Don't. Don't get me wrong. I'm not putting you on the spot. That's just the pictures aren't indicative of a of a normal carriage house. Sorry, Brad. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. That's the mayor's job. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Brad. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Councillor Patton. Yeah, through Madam Mayor, um, we got to keep in mind as well, though, the, the applicant's intention here is to do uh, renovations to uh, these buildings and, and apply for a building permit. So um, through the inspection process, um, we will be able to do inspections of, of the buildings to ensure that, that you know, there'll be only one dwelling for each building uh, moving forward. Um, um, so, but, uh, so that's, that's something that we should be able to, uh, catch moving forward when a building permit is submitted. Thank you. Um, my other question, uh, was, uh, in the discussion tonight, um, the, the suggestion was that one of the ways that we can bring buildings into compliance is at the building permit stage, and that which is where we are right now. And I'm wondering if, um, well, it seems to me that increasing the 
square footage, even though it's a renovation, increasing the square footage on a property or two properties, I guess, oh, I guess all three of the properties, um, is taking it further out of compliance rather than bringing it into compliance, the buildings. Could you, someone comment on that, please? Maybe I'm just seeing it wrong, but it seems to me we're going the wrong way. Sorry. Awesome. Um, so the intent of this application is to bring these uses into compliance because they're there already and they'd like to do renovations, but because the two dwellings that are there um, are non-conforming through this application, they're hoping to bring them into conformance so that they're able to do their renovations and submit a building permit. Well, perhaps I misunderstood. In this in the site plan that you showed us, the cross hatched areas, what, what are those? What does that represent? That's the proposed footprint of the buildings. Um, and as it is right now, they're allowed to cover 40% of their property. And what was shown with the hatched areas was only 27% of lot coverage. Right. So I understand the, the lot coverage piece, but what I'm questioning is uh, the actual square footage of these, well, outbuildings. Maybe they're going to be called principal dwellings because they want to get around that, but that's what my question is. Yeah. So aren't we, isn't the proposal um, to actually increase the square footage? They're also proposing to reduce the floor area ratio as well from 0.45 to 0.35, which would reduce the floor area too. Well, it reduces the floor ratio. I don't know if it reduces the I, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to argue with you. You're the you're the expert in this area, but I will go to Brad to see what he can add to this. Yeah, if I can. Um... The, uh, the the what the council has got before them today is 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 consideration of uh, the the three uses uh, and in in return to for those uh, three uh, uh, dwelling uses, the applicant is actually proposing to reduce the allowable site coverage. Um, so um, the Ariane has pointed out in her presentation that. Uh, if the homeowner decided to build one home, uh, they could substantially increase the size of the, their house, you know, up to 14,000 square feet uh, with the current uh, lot coverage um, that's within the zoning right now. So in, in kind of a trade-off uh, uh, to council, the applicant is proposing, like, if you allow to us to bring into conformance these three uh, separate uh, dwellings, then we will do a reduction of the site coverage from 40% to 30%. Um, the hatch area on the plan are conceptual ideas for the how theoretically they could um, uh, perhaps expand the buildings if, uh, uh, and still meet the 30% site coverage uh, rule, the new rule that they're proposing, but it, they have no concrete plans yet uh, to to actually go forward with an expansion. Uh, they just, primarily, they're just looking to bring these three existing building, buildings into conformance. So hopefully that helps. It doesn't, but thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Councillor Van Elfen, no, sorry, Councillor Carlson and then Councillor Van Elfen. I think Brad um, explained what I was sort of questioning, right? They could either build one mega house, but um, as far as I know, they don't want one mega house. They want three houses for three separate um, groups of people to be living in, which is, you know, if I, if it was my parents that owned that property, I'd feel the same way. So um, I think there's some merit to that. And if we can avoid put, um, forcing them to come up with some strange configuration that makes them all into one giant house, I think that we should be open to that idea. Um, Councillor Carlson, did you have a question or, or, okay. Uh, I was going to, but Brad already answered it. Okay, Councillor Van Elfen. 
Oh, sorry, it's not a question. I'll get back to the question after then or the comment. Oh, sorry. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, would someone like to bring this forward? Thank you, Councillor Carlson, and then we can further our discussion. I will move that zoning bylaw amendment 19223 Lakeshore Drive North bylaw number 2020-029 to allow site-specific provisions at a property located at 19223 Lakeshore Drive North legally described as lot B district lot 673 and 1348 Osuyas district plan KAP 75272 be introduced and given first and second reading and that a public hearing be held on January 11th, 2021. Thank you, Councillor Carlson. You're seconding Councillor Van Elfen. Okay, thank you. Okay, and would you like to carry on with your comment? Thank you, Madam Mayor. No, my my only comment is this is it's an opportunity for the district to bring all these buildings into some type of compliance. And I think that's a good thing. Um, as said earlier, it sounds like the neighbors are in favor of what they're willing to do. And I can understand that if I was a neighbor, I'd prefer to see three different dwellings and one monster house. And I mean, there are ways around it. I'm sure, you know, Brad can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, breezeways, uh, rooftops, you could turn this all into one dwelling real quick, um, you know, legally. So this is one way of getting the, the, the property into compliance. And I, I, I got to take my hat off to staff for trying to work with the, the landowners and see which the, our best result is. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Van Elfen. Any further discussion? Councillor Patton. Um, this site plan that you gave us is from 2001. This isn't even current. Like when you take a look at the block on the bottom, it's from December 12, 2001. So how, how is this related to be current to what they wanna do in 2020? The survey itself might be from 2001, but the drawings were done by the uh, agent for the property who's going to be helping the property owners with their application. And Anthony had asked to demonstrate what the proposed footprints could look like, and she just drew it on the survey from the time. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I'll call the question then. All in favor? Any opposed? Great, that count that uh, carries unanimously. Thank you, Arian. Ready for another one? 9.2 is Z19-012, another site-specific text amendment, this time at 9114. Hoofbeat Street. Okay. okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, so this is an application for a site specific text amendment to the zoning bylaw to legitimize a campground as an accessory use at 9114 Hoofbeat Street. The property's official community plan future land use designation is agricultural and it is zoned A1. The property also falls within the ALR and is subject to the ALR use regulations. So understanding the chronology of the campground use on this property provides an important context to this application. In 2015, the owners obtained a temporary use permit from the district to operate a campground. The TUP expired in June 2018 and no extensions were requested. Despite the TUP expiring, the campground operated in 2018, 
2019 and 2020 without proper approvals in place. Staff were notified in, or yeah, staff were notified in 2018 and 2019 that the owners were operating the comp campground in contravention of the zoning bylaw and sent them a letter in September 2019 demanding that they cease operations immediately and make an application to the ALC for a non-farm use and an application for a site-specific text amendment to the district. The owners made an application for the site-specific text amendment. However, they did not make an application to the ALC as they insisted that their campground was consistent with ALC standards. In December 2019, staff reiterated that an application to the ALC would be required. Due to changes in staff and the owner's winter holiday, the application remained stagnant until spring 2020. In April, staff conducted a site visit and also asked the owners to provide as much information on how their property met ALC standards. The primary concern raised by staff at this time were that the size of the campground and that camping, not farming, was the principal use. So the ALC allows certain forms of agritourism under the ALR use regulations. One tourism activity includes a harvest festival or other seasonal event. The ALR use regulation also allows agritourism accommodation related to that agritourism activity if additional requirements are met. If additional requirements are met. So these include the property having farm status, the total developed area being less than 5% of the parcel, the accommodation being limited to 10 sleeping units, and that the accommodation is provided on a seasonal or short-term basis only. So in the spring, staff were concerned with the size of the of the parcel being used for the uh, camping as well as the duration of the camping as well. So with respect to size, the maximum size of agritourism accommodation is 5% of a parcel. The subject property is 28,218.75 square meters and therefore the maximum size of agritourism accommodation is 1,411 square meters. To determine size, staff conducted both a desktop analysis of the site and visited the property and measured the boundaries of the campground along the hedges. So the size of the campground is approximately 1,400 square meters and meets ALC standards. Staff's interpretation of the developed area includes the perimeter of the hedges and the access area. The sites are able to accommodate the average size RV at 33 feet. If an RV extends beyond this area, it doesn't necessarily change the developed campground itself. Um, okay, so this is also correspondence from the ALC as well. Um, so the other concern raised by staff was that the campground, not farming, was the principal use of the property. The owner suggested that their you pick peach event or peach orchard con constituted as a harvest festival and met the criteria for having an agritourism accommodation. Staff asked the ALC if the peach you pick could be considered a harvest festival and they agreed that it could. As such, agritourism accommodation would be permitted if it direct is directly connected to the agritourism activity. So with respect to this application itself, the property owners would be allowed to operate their campground during peach season only and during the you pick peach events. So now that size and the, act and the activity were confirmed, staff asked the owners to demonstrate how their agritourism accommodation met LC standards and specifically how their campground related to the agritourism activity itself. The owners did not provide this information and continue to operate their campground in the summer. So staff sent another letter to the owners on August 19, 2020, requiring the owners to cease operations immediately and asked them to demonstrate how their campground met ALC standards. They submitted a letter to the ALC who noted that if everything described in the letter is accurate to what's occurring on the property, they don't believe ALC approval would be required. So changes in staff, the owner's holidays and correspondence with the ALC and unclear information regarding the current and future use of this property delayed this application. However, determining whether this proposal satisfied ALC requirements was important to establish the course of this application and providing context to staff's rationale and recommendations. So understanding the sequence of events for this application is important, but so is seeing the physical changes that have occurred on the property itself. 
So as you can see along the northern property line, the owners have planted a substantial amount of peach trees um, since they've owned the property and operated the campground. And they've also noted that they do eventually hope to plant other areas of their property as well. So with respect to district policies, the OCP seeks to strengthen the economic base of the agricultural community and support farmers and their direct farm marketing operations. Similarly, the 2008 Agricultural Plan notes that agricultural economic growth is the best way to promote and sustain agri agriculture in Summerland, as well as the need for the district to support farmers with the necessary bylaws to promote their success. The owners have noted that the majority of their UPIC sales are from their RV clientele and that the future expansion of their farming operation would be dependent on the continuation of their campground. Agritourism accommodation, if subordinate to the agricultural use, aligns with district objectives and policies. So the Agricultural Advisory Committee did not support this application, citing that the primary use of the property appeared to be the campground and not agriculture itself. Um, and conversely, or alternatively, the APC supported the application on the condition that the ALC and district regulations are monitored and enforced to ensure compliance. So agritourism accommodation is intended to be subordinate and ancillary to the agricultural use. If the owners only operate the campground in conjunction with the UPIC Peach event or other related agricultural activity, staff consider the application to align with district and ALC policies and regulations. As such, staff recommend that the site-specific provisions be given first and second reading and that a public hearing be held on January 11th, 2021. Thank you. Thanks, Ariane. Uh, any questions, Council? Councillor Barkwell, please go ahead. Yes, um, there's a slide in there about um, the uh, conforming to ALC regulations um, <clears throat> as a harvest festival. The is that a correspondence from the ALC to you or is that correspondence to the proponent and do you have a copy of that correspondence? Yes, that was an email to me in May and I do have copies of that correspondence. That was a direct quote that I took. But, uh, can you put that up on the screen? Like I, that should have been in our package. I'm kind of annoyed. You know, it was an issue at the Agriculture Advisory Committee meeting um, at that time. It was presented as um, as what the proponent was saying. Okay, so which above criteria are they referring to? So those would be the criteria for the da, 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 for agritourism for like size of the operation and the number of units and such um, if i can interject here uh sorry the uh the, the agritourism activity uh, has some specific uh, criteria that's different than the agritourism agritourism accommodation. So the the five percent uh, size is a agritourism accommodation regulation. So the I think the in this email uh, the ministry staff was just referring to the three criteria uh, for uh, determining if it uh, is is an allowable agritourism activity, which would I think include. Um, uh, it's on farm land, uh, farm assessed land. Um, it's uh, no permanent structures with a, related to the agritourism activity. And there was a third one, I can't remember offhand. Um, but, but they were basically just quoting the ALC Act. Councillor 
Councillor Barkwell, do you have another question? Well, I'm just trying to make it sink in. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, if other people have other questions, could you leave the screen on and then go on to other? Sure, I have Councillor Holmes followed by Councillor Carlson. Yeah, thanks. I was just wondering if we know how, what is the duration for this Peach uh, U Pick event? Uh, how many weeks? I, mean, I, don't, I don't imagine it takes too long to, to, to pick those three, those, those half dozen rows of peaches. Do we, know, do we know how long the event is? So it would be during their U Pick event. So it could last however long peach season is um, and how often people come through the property to pick those peaches. But just, just follow up, but it's just th there are trees that the event is connected to. It's not yep. you pick elsewhere. Yeah. My turn. Um, yes. Yeah. Either Ariana or Brad, I'm wondering if either of you can confirm, but the city of Kelowna has a some form of moratorium or a um, Within, within their agricultural plan and zoning and bylaw, they do not permit RV parks on ALR land. Is that, can you confirm that for me or is that something I would have to get, do further research on? I don't know about Kelowna specifically, but um, agritourism accommodation is something that local governments are able to have some flexibility with. So it is possible that they could um, prohibit this use, but the agritourism activity is a use that cannot be prohibited by a local government. Sure, of course. So the, the actual um, accommodation on site can can be. I think that what I'm what I'm getting at is that the I think this issue is larger than um, hoofbeat campground. It's actually called an RV camping. It's not called hoofbeat family farm or hoofbeat. Um, you pick peaches, it's actually called an RV park. And I think that um, needs to be taken into consideration. But I also think that if we are talking about this one, um, we really need to think about, and this goes back to that conversation I keep bringing up about how we need to talk about our agricultural plan and our zoning bylaw and um, what the expectation is because we may see, you know, if we started putting these into site specific, um, we're going to have them all over town, and maybe that maybe that's what our community wants. Maybe it's not, but I um, I don't think we've had that conversation, and so I'm very hesitant to allow it for something that um, something like this. So I'm just going to put that there and um, suggest if we have a chance to talk about this in a larger context, I think that we should. Thank you, Councillor Carlson. Back to you, Councillor Barkwell. Yeah, um, Councillor Carlson sort of raises a point that's on my mind. I think, and I made this comment at the, at the Agriculture Advisory Committee meeting, I think that there's a lot of farmers that would love to park a few RVs on their property and make extra cash. But, and you know, I don't necessarily have a problem with that, uh, but if it's gonna be done, there has to be, um, it's gotta, there's got to be a limit. There has to be regulations. There is regulations. We know what they are, and they have to conform to them. You know, and and um, you know these guys are not very good at conforming to anything. With uh, um, the obviously they planted everything. Uh, <clears throat> there was uh, cedar trees and such there that they've taken out for this application. They operated uh, too large of an area before, and they operated without any permits for a couple of years and. And, um, you know, if we're going to permit it, I think we've got to make sure it, it stays within its proper limits. Uh, Councillor Carlson, just before you step in again, um, I think that one thing that we need to, to talk about is if this is considered an allowable agritourism activity, um, because the RV, well, sorry, because the campground is associated with their you pick peach orchard, and we know that the season doesn't go from May to September or whatever, um, there, I think there needs to be some consideration around that because 
that is in that's in violation of the what the ALC considers an agritourism activity and that's been fairly clearly stated I think um, so I I would like to to talk about that a bit too and and um, Arian what what are your thoughts on that uh, the duration of the campground? Yeah, I'm, my understanding at least is that yes, it's considered an agritourism activity as long as it's associated with something that actually is agricultural. And if it's the UPIC event is considered their harvest festival, I mean, that, that makes sense, but it the peach, it doesn't... The peach season doesn't run for you know months on end. That's that's my concern, and I'm just wondering um, what your thoughts are on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we with the proposed bylaw, um, we have the months extended, and that's to accommodate um, other crops that they might plant. Um, like they might do have plant apple trees and then harvest them in the fall. So that would give them some flexibility in September and October, um, instead of just limiting it through this application, just to like a two week window or three week window, something like that. And so um, that will be, that'll be monitored or, you know, it takes a while from a tree to <laughs> grow from being a, a stick in the ground, as Councillor Carlson can tell us, uh, to actually producing fruit um, that is harvestable. So I, I'm not sure how how lenient, you know, we, we want to be. They've already gone several years now without conforming and not, not responding to us, I mean, staff. Um, Councillor Holmes. Thanks. Could, could we take the share screen off? Or, or do we still have to look at this? I'd just rather see everybody. But um, I, I, I uh, you know, this reminds me a lot of the, the Rutherford Farm uh, thing. You know, we, we put in the campground first and then maybe we'll plant these, the, maybe we'll plant these other things so we can extend our camping season. So the, so, so the principle is, you know, we have the campground and then what can we what can we build around that campground to to um, legitimize it? And um, for me, there's just um, there's too many ifs in this. The ALC says it's okay if everything this is um, is as describes is accurate. Um, you know, if camping is only during the the UPICs. So there's just too many ifs, and and I, I agree totally with the um, agricultural advisory committee that. Um, this isn't the primary use of the property. The primary use of the, this property is campground. And then they do the agriculture to justify the campground, not the other way around. And, and uh, it's gotta be the other way around. And so I, I'd be happy to, to bring forward a motion to deny this. Okay, I have uh, Councillor Carlson and Councillor Van Elfen. I'll let you go first, Councillor Van Elfen. I'll go after. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, Councillor Carlson. Um, you know, I'm hearing what everybody's saying, and I can appreciate it. And the ALC's ruling on this, like, you know, I'm a small farmer. I could have a campground 12 months a year because I could have them collect eggs. You know, so, I mean, it's an agricultural activity. But this isn't the only one in town. So the other one that exists in town, or I don't know what they're farming, mostly cherries. So is that rules the same for that farm? And should we be looking at all of them? You know, are they all complying to the ALC regulations, the rules, or not? You know what I mean? Like, so if that's the ALC rules, you can only have a campground during cherry harvest, or you can only have a campground during peach season. You know, so if I plant three peach trees, some, you know, or, or some cherries, some peaches, some uh, pears and some apples, I'm good till into late October, you know, so and then I could throw some garlic in and I'd be good through the winter, you know, like, so the rules don't make any sense, personally, so I think we need to 
we should be looking into all these so-called agricultural campgrounds on ag land and uh, review the whole policy. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're, we're talking about this one, but I don't disagree with you, Councillor Van Elfen. Uh, Councillor Carlson and Councillor Barkwell. I have a motion, so if Councillor Barkwell has a question, I'll let him ask it. <clears throat> And I'm, I'm not really comfortable with this uh, um, definition issue. I mean, I spend my life reviewing legislation far more complicated than the ALC. And I don't have enough information there to convince me that uh, this is how it all conforms. Um, you know, I, and I'm not saying it doesn't or, or it does. I just don't have the information in front of me that um, uh, satisfies me that that's how it works and uh you know and 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 uh, and it does create all these things you could have a bunch of chickens running around in the field there and saying and 15 rvs all spread out and saying that the little land between them is used for uh you know chicken uh scratching and and uh herding so okay councillor barkwell i'm just going to stop yeah. you there um, and we'll come back right to you. I'd like to get a motion on the floor and then we can continue this discussion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carlson. Yeah, so I'd like to move that uh, zoning bylaw amendment for 9114 Hoofbeat Street bylaw 2020-032 to allow a campground as a site specific accessory use at a property located at 9144 Hoofbeat Street, legally described as Lot 7, District Lot 473, of Silius District, Yale District Plan 147, except those portions thereof, one, shown as parcel A, and two, outlined in red on Plan B, be denied. Okay, thank you. Councillor Barkle, are you seconding that? Yes, yes. Okay, and now you have the floor. All right, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Yeah, so uh, continuing on with my chicken herding comment, the uh, I, I I like to say I'm not necessarily against agriculture. You know, the using five percent of the land and supplementing to uh, agricultural activities, but I'm not convinced that this one is, fits that criteria. And there's we need to really have a tight definition so that the boundaries aren't aren't um, stretched beyond reason. And there's certain things um, uh, and when we get to that discussion I can add to. Okay thank you Councillor Barkwell. Uh, Councillor Holmes you had your hand up and then Councillor Van Elfen. Uh, yeah just you know it seems to me the LC is, is, is kind of putting into our court saying that um, if everything is if it's a bona fide farm then everything's fine with it but they're 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 leaving it to us to, to, to make the call whether it's a bona fide farm or not. And, and I, I, I don't think it is. And if it was, then yeah, maybe I would think differently, but I, I don't think it is. Thanks. Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to start off by saying I take offense to Councillor Barkwell's comment about chicken wrangling or rustling or whatever you're talking about. But anyways, to continue on, I don't, like I say, I don't have a problem with this land use. The problem I have with this is who's choosing the land? You know, all of a sudden someone just plunks in, you know, 10 RV sites, what, on the best portion of property you own? You know, it's a different story if our planning committee or our planning department and um, the ALC was involved from, from square one and you looked at a parcel, partial, a parcel of your property that wasn't very productive for say, and that's where you wanted to put a campground would make more sense to me than plunking it in some of your best arable property. So that's just a comment and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Councillor Carlson. Yeah, just follow up on what Councillor Van Alphen said. If you actually look at the, um, what was the proposed bylaw they're, the setbacks that are in our um, permit actually require it basically to be in the middle of any property. And I think that's another piece of this um, question, right? I mean, April 1st to October 31st would be the season. Um, peach trees don't bloom until end of April, beginning of May. Um, 
And I think that when you look at 15 meters and 30 meters and 60 meters, if there's a residential building nearby, that that really changes where you could put something like this. And so just like Councillor Barkle and Van Elfen, I mean, there's, I see, I see the merit in allowing um, some of this in certain places, but we need to, you know, so, someone like Davidson's Farm up in Vernon. Yeah, they, they do agritourism and they do it really well. Um, and so putting, putting some RV sites on a place like that makes sense. But when you're just, yeah. And I, I think we, uh, we should talk about it further because there's a there's a great potential, but there's also some big pitfalls, and this I think is one of them. Councillor Barkwell. Yes, uh, Councillor Van Alpen brings up a really good point. That, you know, if uh, if there's an unused corner, and uh, because we all know lots of properties like that, and it's near the property line, I'd certainly entertain a variance to to make that a useful corner, you know, that's not productive anyhow. So I think that what council wants, we want to be doing is, is um, being accommodating where it makes sense, but maintaining the integrity of the farm when it makes sense too. And, and uh, I think by, by, you know, staying with a strict interpretation, we, um, we can limit the abuse. And we don't want to, uh, you know, um, set any precedences uh, that uh, we're not concerned, but still be accommodating. Okay. Any further discussion, Councillor Trainer? Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said, and I just also wanted to add that. Just reading the advisory planning commission's comments, they were concerned um, about um, the district having to enforce and monitor what's going on there and how would that be done. And I just think that it, it just seems this property seems to be creating extra work for staff and, um, and we don't really know what that's going to look like in the future either. Um, so that would be one of my concerns is if this, if this was to go forward, how much effort we would continue to put in to monitor this property. Anyone else? Okay, uh, Councillor Barkwell. I would just add that um, uh, I don't know if I was the only one, I don't remember now at the Agriculture Advisory Committee meeting, but um, that was their concern too. And you know, you, you have to give it some weight, but I don't know if it's a deciding factor, but it's a, it's a factor that you, know, you would give some weight. Okay, I'll call the question. And again, this is uh, is for not to be introduced and read a first and second time with a public hearing to follow, but for denial. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that carries unanimously. Okay. So on to 9.3, ALR 20-003, non-adhering residential use. And this one, no, it doesn't have a, doesn't have, oh yes, it does, 16423 Keene Street. So Ariane, we're keeping you busy tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, so the district received an application for a non-adhering residential use for a property located at 16243 Keene Street. The property's OCP future land use designation is agricultural and it's also zoned A1. And as you can see, these land use patterns are consistent with adjacent properties with the exception of some low density residential along the lakeshore. The property also falls within the agricultural land reserve, hence this application and a uh, non-adhering residential use. Um, some other considerations, um, not 
necessarily pertinent to this application, um, but potential future applications. So the property falls within a high hazard development permit area, as well as an environmentally sensitive development permit area. Um, with any works that occur within the high hazard DPA, uh, an assessment from a geotechnical engineer is required um, and must meet the guidelines for the high hazard development permit. Oh, and with respect to the environmentally sensitive area, the majority of the works are occurring outside of that uh, area. It's mostly confined to a steep uh, gully of sorts. Um, and it's quite steep, so the owners aren't anticipating doing any work in that area. So this is the existing site plan. So really the majority of the works that are occurring are within this yellow highlighted area. Um, the owners are doing some fairly ex extensive renovations to their house, um, and most, which are mostly cosmetic, but they're also expanding the footprint of their house um, and doing uh, adding some more garage space that they're hoping to use for farm equipment. And on the second story of the house not shown here, they're also adding a secondary suite, um, which is increasing the floor area as well. So the ALC restricts the total floor area of a principal residence to 500 meters square or less. And this proposal seeks to increase the floor area from 490.5 meters squared to 535.8 meters squared. And this excludes 400 meters squared, 42 meters squared of garage space as per the ALC's definition of total floor area. So to be able to facilitate these renovations, the owners are, uh, have applied to the ALC for a non-adhering residential use because their proposed floor area is above ALC standards. So here's a picture of the existing house as it is, um, and the majority of the works are occurring uh, just where the part white car is. Um, that's where the footprint is being extended. Um, but the majority of the renovations, like I was saying, are fairly cosmetic. So the house as it is, is quite large, but the owners are hoping to upgrade the facade. Um, the house has good bones, but the deck, for instance, is deteriorating. And there are some other uh, elements to this home that are quite dated. So they're hoping to upgrade that. Um, again, so this is the house as it is, and just to illustrate the proposed floor area, again, it's not particularly large, um, and then from a different angle as well. So the intent of size restrictions is to minimize the impact on productive agricultural land, and the district's OCP and zoning bylaw address this issue by confining residential development to uh, farm residences and also limiting that development to the farm home plate. So the location of the proposed addition is unlikely to affect the farming potential of the property as the location of the development is already paved. Um, and it's already like the house itself is already quite large as well. And the owners have also indicated that they are planning to plant peach trees um, or more fruit trees. So there are about 70 mature apple trees on the property um, down below and in this fallow fields, that's where they're hoping to plant trees. And they're speaking with their neighbors and trying to figure out different agreements um, to be able to facilitate that dream of theirs because they just bought the property fairly recently. Um, and they're also hoping to have some space for their farm equipment um, to be able to help with the existing and the future trees on the property. So at the uh, different committee meetings, both of them supported the application, noting that um, the area is already paved. Um, at the Agricultural Advisory Committee meeting, though, they did raise concerns about um, the, uh, sorry, how having large houses can uh, set a precedence. Um, as far as making farmland uh, more unaffordable to future farmers, um, which is maybe something to take into consideration as far as other applications as well. So given that the house is already quite large as it is, um, and the 
the area of the proposed development is already on a paved surface um, and will unlikely impact the farming potential of the property. Staff recommend that this application be forwarded to the Agricultural Land Commission for consideration. Thank you. Oh, my mouse has disappeared. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. Thank you, Ariane. Questions, Council? I, I have, uh, well, I did have one question and I forgot. Oh, I know what it is. Uh, when, when something like this goes forward to the Agricultural Land Commission, is there any recommendation or um, observations or comments that accompany it on behalf of the district? Or is it just sent through? Yeah, so with this kind of application, I would attach this report. Um, and then also the supporting documents as well. Um, and, but no specific recommendation? No. No. Okay, thank you. Brad, did you have something to add? In general, in general the ALC's perspective is if uh, a local government is forwarding the application to them, they've already given their support to the proposed application. So, because um, if you had anything against this application, you would deny the application right now uh, before it hits their uh, their review. Um, so the, uh, that's the kind of the two-step uh, review and approval process. Um, and it's for that reason as well that we, um, we, re we require applicants to submit uh, an ALC application first before council sees other applications uh, like this one would uh, have a, another application probably for variance permit because um, the ALC may influence uh, your decision for the future, right? And they may deny it as well. Um, so it would be, that application would be, would be moot. Um, so it's kind of a two-step a, a process here for our approval as well. Any other questions of staff? Could I have someone bring this forward uh, for um, pushing on to the Agricultural Land Commission? Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That the non-adhering residential use application ALR 20-003 for a property located at 16423 Keene Street, legally described as that part of a block 12 shown on plan B, 1582 district lot 454, so use division Yale district plan 160 be forwarded to the Agricultural Land Commission for consideration. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carlson, you're seconding. Thank you. And then did you wish to speak to this Councillor Van Elfen? I, yes, Ma Madam Mayor, I just, okay. this is one of those ones that, you know, makes a lot of sense. It's on a, you know, it's an existing, basically an existing building, um, you know, in a parking lot. It's not like we're going to use up ag land, you know, and starting, you know, starting a bunch of excavating work. This is on a paved portion of their property. So I, I have to, I would support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Van Elfen. Any other comments or further discussion on this application? Councillor Carlson. Just a, a little bit more. I know that it was mentioned a couple of the concerns from the advisory committee. Um, one of the things that continues to be a sort of a hot topic is the fact that there's parcels like this with older houses and they're being purchased and then they're being renovated and upgraded and turned into something that many on the committee would consider unattainable for someone who wants to actually buy that piece of property to have a family home and farm on that property. Um, and so I just put that to you so that you know the conversations that are being had. And I know we've talked about this um, around the table a little bit, you know, it's not necessarily that they're just going to be a hobby farmer and they're not going to do anything. That's not what, what I'm saying. I'm saying that, you know, 20 years from now when they no longer 
own or live in that home, who who's going to be able to afford to, or if, even 10 years from now, who's going to be able to afford it? Um, but that's uh, not going to stand in the way of this, but that was a big piece of what they discussed. Okay, uh, ready for me to call the question then. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you for that. So now on to 9.4, Zoning Bylaw 2450 Text Amendment uh, Fruit Stand. Oh, we had talked about this a little bit. Um, is this, yes it is, big surprise. <laughs> Ariane, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is a proposal to amend the zoning bylaw with a site or with a text amendment um, to allow a fruit stand as a permitted principal use within the A1 and A2 zones. So the ALR use regulations specify farm uses that cannot be prohibited by a local government and it includes with the sale of farm products if all the farm products offered for sale are produced on that land or uh, by an association to which the farmer belongs or if the area for the retail sales uh, meets the following conditions. So the total area doesn't exceed 300 meters squared and if at least 50% of that area is limited to the sale of farm products, um, yeah, grown on that land or by an association to which the farmer owns. Um, and as it is right now, farm sales are not currently a permitted use within the A1 or A2 zone, which is a direct contravention of the agricultural use regulations. Um, so at this time, staff are proposing a text amendment to the zoning bylaw to allow a fruit stand as a permitted accessory use within the A1 and A2 zone. So fruit stand is being proposed um, because its definition refers to an accessory building or structure used for agricultural retail sales, um, which mostly meets the ALC standards. So it was identified in the uh, by the representative from the Ministry of agriculture um, at the AAC meeting that noted that although this definition is close to meeting ALC regulations, it still doesn't fully align with their provisions um, because our definition only allows for the sale of farm products that are produced on that lot. So um, at this time though, we are proposing this amendment as an interim solution until we're able to do a more thorough review of our uh, agricultural regulations and able to do public engagement, which is on the work plan for 2021. So with respect to district policies and regulations, the official community plan uh, encourages direct farm marketing operations as a secondary use to permitted farming operations that comply with the policies um, of the Agricultural Land Commission. Uh, this text amendment directly addresses this policy um, and it should also be noted that the definition of agricultural retail sales was already in the zoning bylaw. Um, however, it wasn't connected to a specific zone or use. So staff believe that the intention has been to allow direct farm sales, um, but an error was made in not directly tying it to a zone or another definition. So staff are hoping to rectify this issue through this amendment and to better align district regulations with ALC standards. So uh, this, or this uh, proposed amendment was considered by the Ag Committee and the Advisory Planning Commission and both supported uh, this proposed amendment. And staff's recommendation is to uh, give this bylaw first and second reading. And then because it is a zoning bylaw amendment to waive the requirement to hold a public hearing and to go to third reading to expedite this process. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? I think this is a pretty straightforward one. Could I have someone bring it forward, please? Thank you, Council Carlson, seconded by Councillor Van Elfen. Um, 
Councillor Van Alphen, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the motion reads that it's only uh, fruit stand bylaw, blah, 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 and that the requirement to hold a public hearing be waived, or did I hear Arian say expedited? Am I to be waived, am I correct? Thank you. Brad, did you wish to speak on this? Yeah, I, I would. Uh, through uh, your worship, um, uh, the intent here is that this is mainly an administrative um, uh, rezoning amendment. Um, we don't, uh, st at the staff level, we don't perceive to be any harm. In fact, we'll be probably doing a benefit to a lot of the agricultural land uh, owners throughout the district. Um, and so in order to expedite the process, uh, we are proposing to waive the requirement for a public hearing in accordance with the, with the Local Government Act. Um, we will still be uh, notifying uh, the public through uh, a, an ad in the Summerland Review and our on our on our uh, proper uh, notification uh, uh, requirements for the purposes of a zoning bylaw amendment. Um, but uh, but we will be able to save a few weeks off uh, bringing this back before council for third in adoption with uh, not having to go to a public hearing. Okay, that's clear then. Any any discussion on this? Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? Great, thank you. Uh, and now on to 9.5. The November 2020 Development Services Department Monthly Report. And that's me again. Um, so uh, before I get into this, I do want to thank Ariane for the uh, running the gala there for presentations. Uh, that, um, uh, um, she's done a lot of good work for us here internally and in moving these applications forward. So uh, kudos to her. Um, and uh, so uh, Ariane also has provided uh, um, the, the updates to uh, this uh, monthly report um, that I'm presenting tonight. Um, I, uh, we pres provided a, um, a status updates for uh, a number of uh, current applications we have within our, our system uh, for rezonings, uh, subdivisions, uh, development permits and development variance permits. Um, We've also updated the uh, year-to-date stats we have for development applications, and uh, not much has changed from the last time I presented with regards to ver development variance per permits being the high uh, permit intake for, for 2020. Uh, and then for building permit activity, uh, we've uh, had about on average, a little bit higher than actually on average now, uh, total construction value to date. Uh, not as high as 2019 um, with uh, uh, 31 million so far in 2020 versus 45 uh, million in 2019. But in previous years, you can tell that we are outpacing uh, um, 2016 to 2018. Um, and as well, our building permits issued to date are about on average as well um, uh, for over the last five years. So I'm happy to take any questions from council on our monthly update. Questions? Brad, I'm, I'm just wondering um, if you, if we uh, just ignore 2019 uh, with the 45 million, but we look at this year to date and the other three years to the end of November, um, do you, do you think that that is a reasonable comparison just simply by the increasing costs of, of construction? Well, for sure, yeah. Uh, there would be an inflationary amount for uh, construction costs. So um, we would uh, expect the construction value to increase over time. Um, now, it wouldn't... Uh, a change to a large amount a year over year. Um, so definitely like the jump in 2019 was that we had a lot more activity yeah. in that year. Um, but uh, we, I, I, yeah, I think that 2020 is uh, pretty comparable to those three prior years. Okay, 
Thank you. It's, it's great to see that even in this COVID year that, you know, we're keeping pace. Last year, as you said, was kind of an anomaly, but that's, that's great to see. People are working hard. Okay, any other questions for Brad? All right. Oh, Councillor Barkwell. Yeah, I was just wondering, maybe this is an opportunity to ask, um, how are things with our development process improvement committee? Do they have any more meetings or you know, when's the next meeting and, and what, do we have any outcomes? And yeah, it's a good question. We actually haven't met uh, since uh, Anthony has left, um, other than actually a quick meeting to introduce me. Uh, Anthony did do that uh, right before he left. Um, uh, we we currently don't have any uh, projects per se uh, um, uh, that are would be the purview of the Development Process Improvement Committee. Um, there will be some coming forward in 2021, but uh, you know, with the zoning bylaw amendments, which is which is on the agenda tonight for adoption, uh, and the um, the development procedures bylaw, those were larger items that uh, we're just wrapping up right now. Um, but uh, we do expect to be using them in 2021 uh, for a lot of projects moving forward. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. So we'll receive this for information, please. Councillor Carlson and Councillor Trainer, all in favor? Good. Okay. And now we will revisit 9.6, uh, which is the EV charging. Oh, here it is. Sorry, I'll just find that. Um, or will I? Visitor Center Electric Vehicle Charging Stations, additional information. Hello, Tammy. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council. Thanks for squeezing me in here in this late hour. I'll be brief. Um, as outlined in your package uh, and as requested by council staff have provided additional information regarding the two level three fast charging stations proposed for the tourist center. Based on the direction provided by council at the November 23rd meeting, staff reviewed a number of possible alternate locations. A summary of the advantages and disadvantages as well as a match with the strategic priorities identified by council is provided in the report as is a map of their locations. Additionally, high level cost estimates of the electric and civil works for each location and the corresponding district contributions are presented for your information. Should council direct staff to pursue an alternative location, uh, staff will reach out to the funder to discuss a possible contract amendment and should that be successful, we'll obtain detailed designs and confirm the cost estimates uh, provided are accurate. That concludes the summary of my report and I'd be pleased to answer any questions you have. Boy, that was quick. Questions? Councillor Holmes. Yeah, thank you. It, I was just wondering in the in the chart uh, where you're comparing the different locations, and there's the um, expected usage. How how did you determine um, th that for each site the expected usage? Thank you. Through the chair. Uh, so this is a little bit subjective based on staff's understanding about traffic in the area, um, competing. Uh, uses in the site, um, some sort of informal conversations we've had with EV owners about what they look for in terms of a charging location. And so we looked at um, convenience uh, being the first uh, factor of how close these sites are to amenities and or the highway, and then based uh, the, the notes in the report off of those factors. Okay. 
other questions? <laughs> Councillor Holmes, you again. Thanks. Could you remind me where the other, uh, how many level two chargers are we getting all together? And, and where are the others going? Thank you, through the mayor. So we are adding 16 level twos to our existing oh. three. So we'll have a total of 19 level two or slow chargers. And then we'll have six level three or fast chargers. Right, I meant and, the level three. And so uh, the locations, I can break down the numbers for you, but the locations uh, are Municipal Hall, Memorial Park, the resort, and the post office. And then uh, currently approved is the visitor center for two of the level three terminals. So there'll be one each of the other, those four other locations. Uh, sorry, so to clarify, uh, so at Memorial Park, there are two fast chargers and eight slow chargers. Okay. At Municipal Hall, there are four slow chargers, no fast chargers. At the resort, there is one fast charger and two slow chargers. And at the post office, there will be one fast charger and five slow chargers. Okay. And I hope those numbers all make sense because that was off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's perfect. I was just interested more on the fast, thanks. Yeah. So, so, so can I follow up on that? Yes, then? go ahead. So, so would it be, um, so we might not have want, if we, if we want two fast chargers at, say we pick a different location, could we switch out a, a fast charger, say to municipal hall, put a fast charger in municipal hall and take one of the slow chargers and put it with the other fast charger to where we, to a different location that we plan to move it? Uh, that, thank you. That, yeah, through the sense? chair. Yeah. So, um, the Memorial Park and Municipal Hall installations are complete. Now we could revisit adding a fast charger at Municipal Hall, for example. However, one of the reasons that we didn't uh, propose that originally is the costs for that would be quite high. Um, we need to do quite a bit of civil work to get them uh, side by side. Uh, however, um, if council was interested in co-locating, Something that staff have talked about is currently a council has approved two slow chargers uh, for the works yard in anticipation of us having electric vehicles added to our fleet in the future. And because there was a very attractive grant that was available now, um, we've done some rejigging so that um, rather than putting back the old charger at Municipal Hall and the old one at Memorial Park, we were just gonna move those older ones up to the yards instead uh, so all of the ones downtown are new however what i'm trying to get at is let's say council chose a different location uh, we could look at moving those older two level twos from the yards down to co-locate with the the level threes if that makes sense and then we wouldn't have any up at the yards um, but we could always add those later as well okay and one more follow-up if i may um, so looking further ahead, when we do have a uh, uh, electric fleet, um, can we uh, foresee any uh, possible need where we uh, would need a fast charger for ourselves, for our own fleet? And because um, I'm not sure how, you know, the usage of, of such a, a vehicles would and, and if we need to charge them during the day. Thanks through the chair. Uh, so our fleet is what we would call a return to base fleet. So we would always be coming back to the same location at night, returning to base, and the amount of kilometers that we would drive during the day would not deplete the average electric vehicle battery and certainly not what we would anticipate for vehicles of uh, the utility use that we would be looking to buy. And so we do not anticipate needing a fast charger for fleet vehicles we would be looking at slow chargers for the fleet vehicles and that would actually also help to prolong the battery life in those vehicles as well. Councillor Barkwell. Yes, uh, could you go through with, uh, with us the, each of these locations that are in the pictures? Um, um, 
you know, starting at the top and describe where they are. I'm having trouble like placing all of them. No problem. Yeah, in the interest of time, I didn't want to do that in case I, unless I was asked, but I'm happy to do that. So the first uh, picture is just an overview of the map. Um, right. And then, so the second is the visitor center and the red box is the, approximately where the stations would be at the visitor center. Then the following is the, um, the Verity Street. Uh, so that's just behind the, the Legion um, in the sort of bottom left of that photo is the Legion and the top is the gas station and the red box is approximately where we would be putting the station. The third photo is the arena uh, showing two options. Uh, option one, uh, very close to Jubilee and option two behind uh, the Harold Simpson building. The next is the Turner Street location. So this is a, a park just north of um, the, the gas station and a and in that little commercial area uh, that's shown on the summary map at the start. And uh, so it's a small park um, in, a, in a residential area, but walkable to the commercial area. Um, and there is three-phase power right there, which is one of the reasons that it was brought up by uh, staff in our utility and works areas. Um, the next photo is uh, just outside of, um, uh, I'm not, just, I can't remember, sorry, the proper name of the, the park, um, but just off of the highway sort of across from uh, the wastewater treatment plants and to the north a little bit. Um, just off of the photo to the right would be the sod house. Uh, so that's where that is. And that was um, another location that was recommended is um, it's technically a road right of way that we uh, have some area that could be parking uh, made into parking and it's close to three phase power. Uh, the next photo is the Sani dump, um, just showing uh, sort of a potential area at that location where we could put the stations. Some comments, Madam Mayor? Yes, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, um, the Trout Creek locations, I don't see as being very attractive in that it's hard to get back onto the highway at the sandy dump. Although, I mean, it's possible. And when you need to use a sandy dump, you need to use a sandy dump. And then, and also it's a little bit better down at the other Landry Crescent one is not too, uh, not really that convenient. And it only, although there is a road, so um, uh, <coughs> um, you can access it if you're planning ahead of time from either direction, because you've got the you got the intersection there, but uh, I think that's the intersection. Yeah, it must, it's close to the intersection, yeah. And then of course, uh, as I've always said, I've never liked the um, Chamber of Commerce location because it's uh, access from one direction only. So for me, it, it comes down to the, uh, um, behind the Legion there, Verity Street it's called. For at least one, at least one, but I would prefer to see take uh, both away from the uh, Chamber of Commerce and and um, put them the Chamber of Commerce location. I don't not you know again anything against the Chamber of Commerce and um, and uh, you know put them somewhere else because at the Verity location there's the street light there so you can access them from either direction and you can stroll over and get a coffee or a beer and then go back to your car if that's what you want or you stay in there and, and catch up on your emails and stuff. So I don't know how I would put that in the form of a resolution but anyway before I do that I'd like to hear some comments. Uh, Councillor Patton. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I agree with Councillor Barkwell. I think that both those locations, uh, I, I would even throw in that I would like to see um, uh, one of the quick chargers at the arena. I think that uh, that would be a, offer, you know, a great place for, for a charger there. But uh, I, I don't think that uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce location is the best use for 
for uh, these level threes. So I, I, I agree with uh, Councillor Barkwell to uh, uh, move forward for a couple different locations. Thank you. Um, just, I'll, I'll come to back to you in just a second, Councillor Holmes. Um, Tammy, was there a reason that we discussed before about uh, moving both of them to the same location? Thanks, Madam Mayor. The base cost of setting up a location would need to be duplicated if we split them. Now, um, depending on which location is chosen, that may or may not be a, a very big factor. For example, arena, at the arena option one uh, in the southwest corner of the parking lot is directly adjacent to a transformer. And so the civil costs there would be very, very low. So that may balance off uh, some of the costs, um, say at a different location. But um, generally speaking, splitting the location, splitting the chargers across two locations will drive up the costs. So it's something that uh, we didn't contemplate uh, in the cost analysis, but we can certainly bring back more information uh, if council directs us to move that way. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, Councillor Holmes. Yeah, I guess depending on the cost of, of uh, having separate locations, I, 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 would, I would see one at uh, Vergy Street and one at the southwest corner of the arena. Um, but uh, if it's cost profit, prohibitive to separate them, I, I, I think I prefer to see them both at the uh, at the the arena, the southwest corner, not behind Harold Simpson Center. Nobody really knows that place exists, and uh, and uh, uh, mainly because I think at the arena it would be used by uh, by people passing through tourists. It would be used by residents because it's close to downtown. And it would be used by um, hockey players and people there, you know, who are using the arena. Um, I'm, I'm, my only concern about the Verity is that it's kind of like a, um, a no man's land there. And I, I'd be, uh, I, I don't know if vandalism is a concern for these things or not, but um, it's, it's that, that kind of, that place kind of scares me at night. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if that's an issue or not. Councillor Barkwell and then Councillor Van Elfen. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the Verity location is better than the arena um, because it's close to, as I mentioned, it's close to those convenience stores, close to the a and Those are the things that people want to stop. I really think that given the price, um, people are not going to be using quick charges unless, they, unless they're traveling through. Um, you would charge up at home. Every time you go home, you plug in, you, you know, and that's uh, going to be far cheaper than the... Uh, so local people, I don't see uh, using these charges that much. And, um, and, you know, and it could be an opportunity to spruce up that spot. Uh, I've left my vehicle there lots of times. It's a good place to meet people when you're going to go on a trip somewhere and you, they pick you up at the highway. So uh, that... Um, doesn't concern me. I mean, a lot of people do that. And, and like I say, maybe uh, with the, the charges, we install some street lights and stuff and, and, and uh, make it less scary. Thank you, Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I agree with Councillor Holmes. I like the idea of the arena, that Southwest corner. And it's not just the arena, you've got CrossFit there, you've got the Builders March. So there's a lot of people coming and going there on a daily basis. And I think it would be, you know, a good location. And it not it's not just gonna be the arena patrons, it'll be more than that. Thank you. Tammy, I had a question for you in the staff report in the table where it talks about the um, considerations, I guess, uh, for each of the sites. In the Verity Street one, and I'm going from memory because my, my uh, iPad has died on me. Um, I think it said that there was a, an asterisk there that said short 
term location or something like that. Can you explain that a bit further, please? Sure, and, and Madam Mayor, of course, if uh, you'd like me to share my screen so you can see the report at any time, just let me know, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, so yes, when staff were discussing the Verity Street location, it came up that, um, you know, especially with the provincial mandate that all vehicles sold after 2040 are going to be uh, fully electric or, or um, non, non emitting, non carbon emitting, uh, that a lot of gas stations are probably going to be moving in this direction. And so being directly adjacent to a current gasoline and diesel station, uh, that probably that location will transition over time. And so uh, being directly adjacent to a competitor may affect sales. Now, of course, we also know that being the electric utility that um, they'll still be buying power through us, but uh, the cost uh, they may be able, for example, to to undercut us, right, um, because they are a, a national chain. So that was just a consideration that came up. It's really difficult to predict what that'll look like, but we did want to flag it for Council's attention that it was something that was discussed uh, with our team. Okay, thank you. Perhaps Council doesn't want to be seen as being in competition with one of our local services. Uh, Councillor Carlson and then Councillor Trainer. Or perhaps we do, perhaps when the demand is such that there are no stations at the current gas stations. I mean, that people are going to be drawn, right? That's where they're going to go. That's where they're going to start going or already going to try and um, charge up. And so perhaps there's also a co-benefit to being in a location like that. Doesn't, you know, we put in two now, maybe in 10 or 20 years from now, you put in 20 more. I don't know. Councillor Trainer, Tammy, what's the lifespan of the chargers? Thanks through the mayor. Uh, they're expected a minimum of 10 years. I mean, the manufacturers always give you sort of a, a very conservative estimate, um, but that's what their, their minimum expected lifespan is. Um, the fast chargers are a newer technology, so it's more difficult to speak to, but uh, the level twos we've had in place since 2013 and knock on wood, we've never had a service call on them yet. So, so far they're performing very well. And the manufacturer that we've chosen is a very reputable, uh, they're, they're one of the sort of best in the business, if you will. And so we're, we're quite confident in uh, the product that they're su they supplied to us. Okay. The reason I was asking is because I was just thinking of the likelihood that that Petro Canada, I think it's a Petro Canada on the corner there, would be putting in their own charging stations. And if they wouldn't be doing that for say 10 years to meet the 2040 um, benchmark or um, whatever for electrical vehicles, um, that it, it is still worthwhile then for us to put them in that location because we would get a good couple of years out of them before, do you know what I'm saying? Like before the gas station might consider putting their own in. Um, my second thought was, um, if we were to put them at that location, would we need to put in street lighting? Like, would there be any other infrastructure that needs to go in there to make it a kind of an appealing site to charge your vehicle? Thanks through the mayor. So uh, for any site that we choose, uh, lighting is a consideration. And so we would definitely be looking to add lighting, uh, not only for uh, security, but also just for general safety. We want people to feel um, like they're not a tripping hazard. We're going to be addressing those things through railings and, and other considerations. So there's sort of a whole package that goes into that uh, design of a particular location. And we'd be exploring all of those details once we uh, figure out which site we're going to go to. Uh, Councillor Barkwell. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> once uh, gas stations start putting in um, electric charging stations and, and who knows when that'll be, but it's gonna be a very expensive and very big endeavor for them. I don't think that uh, we'll have more business over at the arena than we would at the Verity location. It uh, will still always be a less popular location. Uh, I repeat to Councillor Van Elfen my argument that uh, uh, locals are not gonna be using fast charging stations. The uh, it's only a, a traveler, a local is doing local trips and they would be on their uh, charge that they'd, you know, gotten the night before. 
Yeah, it's it's really for the convenience of the traveler. So uh, I think that uh, maybe we can compromise and and have one at the Verity location and one at the arena. But uh, I don't think I want to see two of them at the arena. Tammy, can I ask you to put up the? Let's see, what do I want to see first? Um, I think the table first. And then I'd like to have a look at, I think it was photo three, the Turner Street spot. Certainly, Madam Mayor, just let me get my screen uh, ready for you here. Can you see that okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'm looking at the Verity Street one as well, the right of way. And this, this kind of comes and goes, but, um, you know, we've heard it again fairly recently about the potential for development there in the Legion area. Um, I guess the, I guess it's, it's still just potential. And could I have you just bring up the map or the photograph? Um, let's down one more or another one. <laughs> that one, just a sec. Mm -hmm. This is the Turner Street one, right? And to the right of it is the highway? That's correct, yes. Okay. And so right now, all there is is a couple of, yeah, there's a, there are homes there fairly close, hey? Like, yeah, this is know. a residential property here, one across the yeah. street. Before. Um, it, it is a, a park, it is a public park, so it has a picnic bench and, and whatnot. So, but um, yeah, th this was an interesting one in the staff discussion. There was definitely some very strongly for and some not so sure. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, looking at the residential aspect of it, it's not really any closer than the ones that across at across from the Wharton Street project or Hillcrest development um, to the Memorial Park, right? That one is nice and visible there. Is there any lighting in there? Uh, I'm not aware of any, Madam Mayor, and this is on um, these lines you're seeing are off of the electrical GIS. Now, I can't recall if I had that layer turned on or not. I mean, you can see up here, these are street lights. So I suspect the oh, I see. turned on, but uh, I couldn't say for sure. I'd have to, I'd have to take a look. And then you said something about three phase power at this site already? That's right. The red checkered line indicates the three phase uh. power line. And is that required for these? The fast chargers, yes. It's one of the reasons that the visitor center location, there's a, a higher mm. cost than the others because there's mm. no three phase power there currently. Well, I'm not adverse to this, this spot with it being close to the highway and close to, you know, walkable um, retail and shops, if you needed to use a washroom, I mean, there's <laughs> Max and, and the other, um, not Max, um, uh, Petrocan and the other service station across the street. It's highly visible. Councillor Barkwell. Uh, I was just wondering what you saw uh, attractive about this site, like, 
Are you thinking it's preferable to Verity Street only because you think there's potential for other things at Verity Street? Because I, I don't remember ever hearing of any uh, possibilities there on that piece. Well, I know that the Legion at one point anyways, I think this was in our last term, was talking about uh, building in that area. I think it was building up, not necessarily uh, creating a larger footprint. Um, sorry, um, and just to continue in answering your question, um, I like this spot uh, because it's highly visible from the highway. You can get to it whether you're heading north or south, and it's close to, um, you know, walkable amenities, and it's, you know, close to downtown. I mean, it's close to the... <clears throat> to the perch and the legion and other places where you can sit down and have a good meal. So it's got three phase power. That's, those are some of the reasons why I'm thinking not necessarily that it's better than the Verity one. I'm just, nobody has talked about that. And I would just like to get some, some consideration for this spot too. That's all. Okay. I agree with all those points. Uh, I just thought I was, uh, I don't think that there's anything, any possibilities for other things at that Verity Street location. The, the Legion has a, a, the creek between it and that property, so it can't like expand that way or anything. Yeah, I think the discussions, at least that I've heard, is that they were thinking of building up, not necessarily expanding yeah. their footprint. Councillor Trainer. I guess what we have to think about is what is the easiest lo uh, what is the easiest location for people to get to off of the highway or see? I mean, obviously, I would hope that there's signs on the highway that give people a warning to turn off and go to either location. But um, I think we just have to think about it from a user perspective. Um, which one is is the quickest and easiest to get to and makes the most sense? So I, I mean, they're they're kind of equal, but I, I think maybe the Verity is slightly better and slightly easier to get to. That's just my thought. Okay. Um, I guess, Tammy, if I could ask you to stop sharing your screen so that I can see everyone. Thank you. Oh, good. There we go. Councillor Holmes. Yeah, I think the uh, Verity Street would be a bit more convenient than Turner in terms of services, uh, in terms of popping over to um, to the perch to get a pint while you're <clears throat> while your uh, uh, car's charging. Um, so I, I'm I'm okay with with the two fast chargers at Verity Street. I, I still think the arena would have been a great option to have some slow chargers, and we should have thought of that earlier, I guess. But I, I really like that location. But if if uh, in the sake of expediency, I'll bring forward the motion to, to install the uh, the two fast chargers to approach the funders to change two fast chargers to Verity Street. Okay, Councillor Van Elfen, you're second, second Dean. Thank you. Any further discussion? Councillor Carlson. Just that um, I, I will agree with this. I think that we also you know, Turner, Turner is a good location because people don't, we don't necessarily need to encourage going to have a pint, but we could certainly encourage sitting in a nice lovely park or getting a cup of coffee or watch the cars, whatever. Yeah, especially if you have kids or dogs, right? <laughs> Let them out and run around a little bit. Uh, Count Councillor Barkwell. You know, you, uh, Councillor Carson, you've made me think, yeah, a couple of picnic tables and people would really like that at the, that street, but maybe we can, uh, there was, there, there's also some picnic tables there. Oh no, they've been smashed up and ruined at the, in the green space by the uh, Mac store. So, uh, and the other thing on the, on the signs is that I guarantee you, everybody will be navigating to these uh, locations on their GPSs and their and their phones. Yeah, yeah good point. Uh, Councillor Holmes and then Van Alphen, did you have your hand up again? No, 
Okay, Councillor Holmes. I'd be happy to amend the motion to Turner Street, but <laughs> either one is fine. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have, <laughs> yeah, Aaron shrugging her shoulders now. Um, well, the, the motion that's on the table is for both fast chargers at Verity Street. So I guess we should uh, vote on that. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Aaron again. Um, so all in favor? <laughs> yeah, that, that's me too, Councillor Carlson, sure. Uh, good. Thank you, Councillor Holmes, for bringing that forward. And Tammy, you have the last word. Um, thanks, Madam Mayor. And thanks again, Council, for uh, squeezing this in tonight. Um, I just wanted to, you don't have to decide tonight, but again, mention that if there is an interest in putting level twos at the arena, that we do have the opportunity to relocate those two from the works yard. So uh, certainly that's something that we can explore the costs of and bring back information if council uh, has an interest in that at a future time. Do we have an interest? Thumbs up. Yep. Great, thank you, Tammy. Thanks for that reminding us of that. Thanks, Council. Good night. Good. Good night. So we're on to item 10.1. Um, it's adoption of our zoning bylaw amendment, administrative and modernization amendments. So we've been through the process on this one, and it's just for adoption. Uh, any questions of staff? I think we're probably good. Okay, could I have somebody bring this forward for adoption, please? Councillor Carlson, seconded by Councillor Holmes. Any further discussion? Good job, thank you for getting this done, Brad. Okay, um, all in favor? Okay, none opposed, thank you. And then there's nothing out of the committee of the whole or closed. Any notice of motion? All right. So on to information items. There are four pieces of correspondence. And anything that someone would like to bring forward? Okay. Um, so can we have those be received for information, please? Councillor Van Elfen, Councillor Holmes, all in favor? Thank you. 13.2, committee commission minutes. Um, just one, Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission. Uh, I'm not sure what date oh yes august the 24th anything that needs to uh be updated on those uh councillor trainer you're the council rep so it all look good to you i can't remember that far <laughs> <laughs> yes it looks fine yeah, okay it's, great it's, yeah. good thank you so you're willing to bring that forward for information yes. yeah thank you and seconded by Councillor Van Elfen, thank you. All in favor? Great, thank you. Um, on to council reports. So let's start with Councillor Carlson tonight. I have, um, I don't think anything to report other than I've been going for walks every night and there are some really nice lights in our town right now. Yeah. So keeps uh, the spirit up it's really nice good so have a wonderful holiday everybody and stay safe thank you councillor carlson uh councillor Patton. uh thank you madam mayor uh nothing new to report uh this week so and okay. uh
wish everybody a great Christmas and uh, we'll see you in January. It's kind of surreal, isn't it? We're through this first year of COVID. Uh, Councillor Holmes. Uh, no, I, I just like to say that I'm looking forward to our next council meeting with our, our we'll be able to introduce our new CAO. That, that'll be quite exciting. And I'm sure there's probably nobody who's looking forward to his arrival more than our acting CAO. And uh, <laughs> so I would like to uh, thank Karen for uh, filling in for the least last couple of months. Yeah, you, you've done a great job. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Holmes. Uh, Councillor Van Elfen. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just a few things to report. If you happen to run into a Rotary member in Summerland, congratulate them on their 75th birthday. They've been uh, a service organization in town for 75 years now. And if you get the opportunity, go down to the Rotary Park and Pier and have a look at the light display that Rotary has put up. And they also did yesterday, they did the West Summerland Station. Um, so they're just adding a bunch of festive cheer during this time of year. And uh, one other thing, if I may, there's a young lady in town. She's seven years old. Her name is Blake Carlson. And last year, with her help of some elves, she baked cookies and sold them and, and raised $1,100 for Toonies for Tots for Teens. I think, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. And this year I had the opportunity to buy a couple dozen of her cookies and I haven't ate them all because I'm, I'm being good. But this year, yesterday she was on track to, to uh, make $2,300 to donate to the fire hall to, to their Toonies for Tots for Teens. So hats off to uh, young Blake Carlson and uh, her elves. Thank you. Merry Christmas to all of you. Fantastic. Uh, Councillor Van Elfen, can you tell us uh, how the Rotary is doing with their fundraiser? Is it is it working well? I believe I believe they're getting some uh, online uh, support, and uh, this is just to try to raise money because they want to look into investigating next year the, the Giant's Head Mountain lighting that up. So there was a few uh, obstacles and a bit of roadblocks this year, but uh, the pier was their second choice. And to get an opportunity to go down and have a look, it is quite spectacular. Good. But I, I, I don't know the numbers yet, Madam Mayor, but I'll try to find out for our next meeting. Okay, thank you so much. And Councillor Barkwell? Uh, <clears throat> I guess if we're not having the closed meeting, uh, see you all next year, hard to believe, so. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. We haven't talked about it yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not letting you off that easy. Councillor Trainer. Um, I don't have anything to report except for um, Councillor Holmes and I are now going to be alternating our months for writing our reports from the RDOS meetings. So December is my month and um, following in Councillor Holmes' uh, footsteps is a lot of work. I had to proofread my... <laughs> <laughs> or about 50 times because <laughs> I knew it would be compared to his um, but it is in the um, correspondence it's uh, attachment C and I did send it to you all so yeah enjoy that reading material good thank you Councillor Trainer. um I think I've got everyone yes uh now is there anybody that that is wanting to uh comment public or media no all right, so um, before we adjourn, could we have a quick discussion on whether or not we want to uh, move into the closed session? Uh, so without, um, you know, without any discussion of details or anything, uh, is there anything on there that, um, and Karen, you would be the one to answer this, uh, that we need to get to before the January 11th meeting, because that's a month away. Madam Mayor, if I can suggest uh, the special meeting that was convened today to read the bylaw, to give the bylaw adoption on Friday, if we could go into closed on Friday, if that's uh, okay. 
council was agreeable, we could do that session on Friday afternoon. Okay. Uh, how does council feel about that? That would be Friday. I think that meeting starts at four. The adoption will be really quick. We did the EV charging tonight. Uh, so would it be reasonable to expect that it will be will be done within an hour? Yeah, there's a few, a few updates that council may want before, before yeah, you. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, council, does that sound good? Say four to five o'clock on Friday? Okay, good, thank you. So um, I will call for adjournment then. Great, thank you. Happy holidays, everyone.